topic for today is then and now. We're focusing on domestic violence and our research, three research projects that we've conducted in the area of violence against women. Hello, I'm Rebecca Dobash. Hello, I'm Russell Dobash. We will move through some of the past, present, and future, beginning with what we call then, and that is the past. And we begin with the research that we've conducted in the area of violence against wives. And you will see down there the, the cover of the book, Violence Against Wives, we'll overview that. And then the Women, Violence, and Social Change, which is another uh, topic of research that we conducted. And thirdly, evaluation of programs for abusers. And we will end with some questions, issues about where we are now, uh, and we will show you two world maps to do this. We begin with traditional beliefs and social responses that often, particularly in the past, supported the use of violence against women, particularly by husbands, by wives, what was then called wife beating. Since the 1970s, various social changes have occurred in this area, including the beginning of the refuge movement, women's aid in, in Britain and various other named groups in the US, programs for abusers, changes in the law and police and law enforcement, social services, healthcare, housing, and much, much more. Our first piece of research that we're going to discuss today was the study of domestic violence in the UK and Europe, beginning with our work in Scotland in 1974. The research involved was sociological in nature and involved two research methods. Interviews, in which we conducted with 104 women who were the first residents in the Women's Aid Refuges in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and the study of police cases, which involved the reading of 34,724 police cases for an entire year of all of Edinburgh and one area of Glasgow for the year 1974. And it is, we looked at all the police cases for one year, and, and we had to read, these were not computerized at that time. It was necessary to simply, they were on, usually on four by six cards or in some filing cabinets. And we read all of these cases one at a time. First, to ask the question, how many police cases involved any form of violence between anyone, men against men, men against women, children, anyone. And we found three of the 34,000 cases, we found 3,020 cases that involved any form of violence. We then looked at all of those police cases that involved any form of violence to say, and ask the question, how much of this involved violence against wives or women partners? And we found 759 cases out of the 3,020, that is 25%. And in addition, we found that 12 cases, i.e. 1%, involved violence against a husband by a male, by, or a male partner. The figure of 25% of violence against a police uh, uh, work involves violence against wives is repeatedly cited and used in various forms. And you see in the upper left-hand corner, this was a street demonstration in support of changes and obtaining refuges and changing laws for women. And you'll see the poster in the upper right hand says 25% of violent crime involved wife assault. And that is a piece of sociological research, our research that ended up in a social campaign trying to be change for women who were abused. These findings not only are used here in this, police, in this street demonstration, but have been used in many other areas and in supporting the women's aid and, and various groups throughout the world. Some of the conclusions from this research and the Violence Against Women study are the following. First, that gender violence is asymmetrical. And that asymmetrical means that it's largely women who are the victims, age, very few men, 
mostly women, and it is largely men who are the perpetrators, very few women perpetrators, most of the perpetrators are men. The violence itself is serious and consequential, uh, not trivial as many had tried to say at the time. And the risk factor for this kind of violence is an intimate relationship for women. It includes a constellation of abuse. That is physical violence, sexual violence, coercion and controlling behaviors, including uh, keeping the women inside the household, uh, keeping her short of money, making sure that she has no resources, that she has few friends. This violence is worldwide. It is a problem in need of change. And we need to move from tolerance and indifference to this problem to one of action and rejection. And when we shift to the area of social change and ask the question, what is a transformative project? What needs to change? What needs action? What needs research? We focus in three arenas in which social change takes place. At the individual level, changes in beliefs and behaviors. At an institutional level, changes in policies and practices and at a cultural level, changes in pop, pop, popular beliefs and practices. As well as investigating the prevalence and nature of intimate partner violence, of course, specifically violence against women that, uh, by their husbands or, the, or their, uh, the man they were living with, we investigated the development of the battered women's movement and resulting in a book called Women, Violence and Social Change. We basically, what we did was we investigated the early uh, developments of the battered women's movement through two research methods. One involved interviews of people who had been involved in developing shelters and dealing with violence against women. And, otherwise, and secondly, we used documents that had been produced by the state and of course by women who were attempting to change the state's response uh, to violence against women. The focus then was on first the creation of the first refuges and shelters. How did they develop? How did they come about? How, what, who were the women that were involved? And here we found that the, the pattern was pretty similar. In the US and the UK, it was women who opened up their homes to women who had been abused and gave them shelter. And of course, this shelter also involved many, many children. The general orientations and philosophies of the groups were quite similar. They basically came out of women who had been working on other justice programs, of social problems uh, that were in, in happening at the time, but focused on violence against women. The specific goals and achievements occurred in various areas, uh, housing, police, courts, law, social work, and so on. And the, there was a difference here in that the, the British uh, movement focused primarily on housing, whereas the Americans focused on criminal justice. There were all sorts of things happening, all sorts of things that are still happening. So, for example, rather than just focusing on shelters, there was a focus on creating better uh, methods of contacting women and for women to contacting them. Victim services, helplines, housing, both temporary and permanent, particularly in the UK. There were public education programs, and they continue today. One of them was zero tolerance of violence against women, which was uh, created in Scotland. Education and training for women who had been abused became very important. Services for children, changes in, in separation uh, arrangements, divorce and visitation rights of children. Health services became an important aspect of the intervention and the development of economic opportunities. What was very distinct, very distinct in the US were that women activists uh, had developed for programs for male abusers. Why focus on men, people might say. Because some women said, we don't want to focus on men. We want to get on with the most important work, which was helping women. But the problem is, 
in, rooted in men's orientations, men's violence. So there needs to be a focus uh, on, on men. And we, what do we need to do when we focus on men? Well, we need to, to change their beliefs, their thinking, and their behavior. We need to change their sense of entitlement, entitlement to tell women what to do, ignore women's concerns, and so on. They were very self-oriented men. They also objectified women. Women were to be victimized, and they were victims, and to be ignored. Their violence was purposeful and functional. That is, it wasn't about mental illness. It wasn't about anger and so forth. It was this, these men were purposeful, purposeful in using violence to silence women, to cow women, to drive women out of the home. So they rejected responsibility for their violence and the consequences. The consequences were denied or minimized. So programs for abusers focused on men taking responsibility for their violence and examining their beliefs. So for the programs we saw in the US and the people we talked to, it became very clear to us that we needed interventions for men in the UK. And very early in, in this work, we decided that it was worth working on developing a program for men. And with the help from our, our colleagues in the US and with, with the help from people, other folks in, in the UK, we began to develop a project that was called Change. Change was the first male the program for male offenders in the UK and in Europe. Uh, there was a second sister program called Lothian, and that was in, worked in Edinburgh, where its change was focused at Stirling University. Now, there's an overall arching program uh, for dealing with offenders and, and working on uh, men who abuse, and it's called Respect, and it's now nationwide based in, uh, in, in London. So the general focus, feminist gender-based approach with a focus on power, control, and violence, and using a cognitive behavioral approach rather than say a psychoanalytic. Volunteers, uh, the programs use volunteers and criminal justice-based approaches. So as well as working on uh, establishing these programs, we carried out an evaluation. Evaluation research usually involves comparison, and that's what we did. We compared two approaches to abusers. One was a criminal justice system uh, response, which usually involved fines, and that was it. No, no other interventions. Then there were ones that were criminal justice based as well, and but involved men going on to abuser programs. So what we did was compare these two groups on various uh, aspects of their behavior. This involved 122 men and 134 women partners, including 95 couples. So we assessed behaviors at three times, behaviors and orientations at three times. Time one was the baseline when, when they were sentenced to a, a criminal justice based program uh, or to um, some other uh, some other sanction. Three months later, we in interviewed them again, and 12 months later, at the end of, of their uh, sanction. So we, we, we evaluated developments in physical and sexual violence, improvements and reduction in injuries, reduction in injuries, and reductions in contro controlling and, and abusive behavior, because this was part of the constellation of abuse and it needed to be dealt with as well as the violence itself. And we asked women whether their quality of life had improved over that year. Finally, we considered the sustainability of change. And all of this was in women's reports. What we found were significant differences between the two approaches in all areas with abuser programs having more positive changes. Now, we move to the more recent past over the last two decades. Those are the, say, the first two decades of this movement. We're now moving to the last two. And we're going to give you only two examples of some major changes that have taken, taken place worldwide since the 1970s. First, 
the Declaration of the United Nations on Violence Against Women in 1993, and then a, a one-day survey of refuges and shelters worldwide in the year 2015. In 1993, the United Nations Declaration stated that violence against women is a violation against human rights. They made it a top priority to eliminate violence against women and girls. And they believe that the orientation to this should be achieved through gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. And this declaration and this approach toward change for women and girls was adopted by 193 member states throughout the world. Another major indicator of how much things have changed from then until now, in 2015, there was a single day global count in 46 countries around the world in order to establish, was there anything there? If so, what? And how many women and children were being served? They found 2,497 shelters throughout the world on that single day count. They found that 53,230 women had been served on that single day. And they found that 34,794 children had been served on that single day. So that was a one day count of what was happening in the world on that single day. This was presented at the World Congress of Global Networks of Women's Shelters in 2015. Since the 1970s, much progress and many social changes worldwide have been made. But it is to be remembered that 28 nations still have no law against domestic violence and that emerging issues continue to appear, such as the use of mobile phones and media and various other forms of technology or in order to harass women. Across the world, from then until now, there have been more countries that have shelters, refuges, hotlines, and support for women who are abused. And what we are now going to show you is two world maps that we constructed to, to illustrate the point of how much provision there was then in the 1970s and how much provision there is now. We began from once there were a few. And we see here on this map, you'll see five white tags hanging on the map. These are tags that are placed at the only shelters there were for women at that point in time in the beginning in the 1970s. One of the tags is in Scotland. One of the tags is in England and over in the United States. Another one is in Boston on the right hand side, the East Coast. In the middle, you find Minnesota. And on the West Coast, you find a white flag in California. That was then. This is now. There are flags hanging all around the world. Well, not all around the world. There are some places that still do not have flags. They do not have provision for women. But it is astounding at how much this social issue has become recognized as a worldwide problem and the responses to this problem that have proliferated around the world from then and to now. Here we have the three pieces, the three books that we wrote on the research that we've discussed today in the middle, Violence Against Wives, on the left, Women, Violence and Social Change, and on the right, Changing Violent Men, all cover in detail this research. At the bottom, we also have two others that were not discussed today, and there's our current research that we've conducted on a murder study of when men murder women, and in 2015 that was published in the latest Male Male Murder in 2020.